The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. Okay, so question number one. How does one get rid of fear or come to terms with it? The thoughts of fear can be quite obsessed. Uh, yes, so how do you overcome fear? It's a, uh, you have to kind of, uh, so, so often you have to investigate these things a little bit uh, and to see what the fear stems from. Uh, uh, sometimes it may have fairly clear causes. Uh, there may be particular things that you are afraid of. Uh, and if you know the particular things that you are afraid of, uh, you can start working on those perceptions uh, yeah, and look at those things from a different angle. Uh, in a similar way that we develop the mind in meta towards people, uh, you can see everything from different angles, uh, and it really depends on how you look at it, uh, whether you feel fear or not, whether you feel anger or not, uh, and everything can be cultivated in this way. Uh. So just try to uh, see the cause, and usually there, some, often there will be causes. Uh, uh, if there is no particular cause, you cannot see any cause. Uh, maybe it is something that kind of lies deep in the past and it's hard to tell. Uh, in that case, you have to have a more general change in your perception. And just remember that fear, it has to do with that uh, a general kind of lack of confidence in the future. You're afraid something is going to happen in the future that will go wrong or whatever. So you have to start looking at the future in a more positive way. Think of all the things that can go right. Uh, think about all the things that can go in a good way. Look at the alternatives. The fear will tell you a negative outcome. Remember the positive outcome. Uh, and uh, if you are on the Buddhist path and you are living well and you're doing all the right things, uh, the chances of a positive outcome are far greater than a negative outcome in the long run at the very least, yeah? Much better. So why think about the negative outcomes? Uh, so keep on, uh, keep on just reflecting like that. And uh, again, there is no magic bullet. It's not going to kind of happen just overnight and you are done with the fear. It's uh, like with so many things, it's a process. Uh, and you have to keep on at the process. Uh, and eventually, one day, suddenly, uh, you're rid of it and you feel, yay, no more fear. Then it comes back again. Uh, <laughs> yeah. and, but then it, it, it gradually becomes less and less and less. Uh, this is kind of the point here. Uh, and then one day, suddenly you feel that for the first time uh, you have no, no fear for, for a long time or whatever. Uh, so uh, it is just a matter of developing your perceptions uh, in this way. Uh, um, I'm not saying it's easy, but uh, that is, I think, really the, most, the best way of dealing with these things. Uh. Okay. Okay, has the Buddha mentioned yoga uh, as a tool to prepare the body for meditation, or is it uh, contraindicated in Buddhism? I find practicing gentle yoga significantly helps to relax the body and breath before meditation. Okay, uh, good. You know, do that if you find that it helps to relax and it makes you feel more at ease. It's uh, uh, nice to do yoga. Um, uh, has the Buddha mentioned yoga? The word yoga actually does occur in the suttas, uh, but it has a very different meaning. Yoga means like uh, effort in the suttas. Uh, yeah? The Buddha says yoga karani or yoga karani, which means an effort should be made uh, to achieve a certain result. So it means like an effort in meditation practice or an effort in anything uh, to achieve a certain outcome. Uh, and this is the original meaning of the word yoga. It means like an activity, actually means a yoke. You are yoked to something and you act and you, you do an activity in connection with that. The modern version of yoga where you do kind of exercises and, and, and you kind of do various asanas and that kind of thing is a very kind of modern development. And uh, even the yoga as a religious practice they do in India is not is quite different from that, uh, uh, or sometimes is anyway, from wh what kind of the modern version is. Uh. So in the early sutta, it has a very different meaning. But don't worry too much about whether the Buddha mentioned this as a tool or not. Uh, if it relaxes you, if it gets you in a good state of mind, and it kind of gets everything together, uh, please use it. Yeah, it's, it's certainly nothing wrong with that. And particularly... Uh, particularly if you feel a little bit stressed, and people often get a lot of stress these days, uh, then do something to de-stress before you go down into your meditation practice. Uh, and that can be anything. Some people like to do a bit of chanting. Some people like to uh, hear a bit of kind of, you can even put on a bit of music if you want to. Yeah, kind of not uh, kind of heavy metal, but something kind of, you know. <laughs> 
something soothing and nicer yeah and uh, and uh, that sort of thing and then you kind of use the sensual world in a way to make you more peaceful uh, going into nature is a great thing to do nature in a sense is sensual because it is a sensory impression uh, but it is a sensory impression that makes you more calm uh, and that's what, that is why nature is always considered a benefit in uh, in buddhism uh, to be able to go for a walk in the forest and that kind of thing i don't know if that's possible for you so all of these things yeah including yoga are good things to do if it leads you in the right direction it is the outcome and the result that decides whether something is good in buddhism and if the outcome is good it's heading you in the right direction then you're doing something that is useful there sometimes you can be doing the right thing yeah or you think you're doing the right thing but it doesn't really have the outcome then you are perhaps not doing the right thing after all yeah or you're doing the right thing in the wrong way or something like that and then uh, Uh, so you have to be quite clear that the outcome is what matters. Uh, are you getting somewhere what you're doing here? Okay. Dear Ajahn, how easy or difficult is it to practice in lay life? Uh, uh, I don't know. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I find that trying to sort matters out even just to help the family comes back as a hindrance uh, especially when there are big decisions in life uh, not sure how to deal with this uh, um yes uh, you sometimes you know when when there are many problems and many things they tend these things tend to kind of uh, get stuck in your mind and it can be very hard to get you know to for the, to let go of them and to just to be peaceful uh, Uh, and uh, this can happen even to people who have practiced a long time yeah people who are abbots of a monastery and they have big responsibilities and sometimes they think about those responsibilities simply because that's kind of a tendency of the mind even when you've been doing this for a long time uh, so uh, uh, what you have to do is you have to try to this is the hard part try to sort out your family matters without too much attachment to the result Yeah, do it in a nice way. Do it with kindness. Do it with compassion. Uh, and then, uh, if it works, great. If it doesn't work, okay. That what can you expect? Uh, yeah, this kind of the right attitude. What can you expect? Uh, you can never, you can never be sure that your efforts will actually work out and will give the results uh, that you're hoping that they will give. Uh, so sometimes you just have to let go at the end of the day. Uh, you have to realize that very often the world. Uh, I talked about this yesterday. The world just goes contrary to what you expect it to do. Your family life goes contrary to what you expect it to do. Everything can go contrary to what you expect it to do. And because you kind of, uh, after a while, you wisen up to that, uh, you become kind of, you understand the Buddhist idea of impermanence or inconstancy or out of control, and all these kind of things. Uh, you're, not so con you're not so surprised anymore when things go contrary to what you expect. Uh. And then when you come to your meditation, you realize, well, all of that, because it is so uncertain, uh, uh, just let go of it. Uh, now is the time to be peaceful. Uh, now is the time to relax. Uh, and then when you become peaceful, sometimes the solutions come to you uh, out of the blue. Uh, it's like a intuition that just arises. Suddenly you just know what you have to do. Uh, and this is fascinating. It shows the weaknesses of the thinking mind. The weak thinking mind is very bad at solving problems. Uh, you often you tend to go around in circles, uh, and suddenly when you stop thinking, suddenly it's it's kind of bleeding obvious what you have to do. Huh? You know exactly what you have to do huh? because uh, it's kind of been staring you in the face all the time. Huh? But the thinking got in the way of the solution. Huh? So intuition is very useful. Uh, intuition uh, works when the mind is clear, when you haven't got any strong defilements. Uh, and then sit down and allow the results to come to you rather than trying to obsess with finding the solutions to these things. Uh. And one of the tricks is to remember that that world outside will never be right. It will always be problems. Okay, so even if you solve this problem, there will be another one coming up straight behind it. Uh, so what are you going to do? Are you going to keep on thinking about these problems forever? Uh, are you going to worry about the problems you don't even know which, which ones they are yet? Uh, because you could argue that, you know, I know there will be more problems tomorrow, so maybe I should uh, worry about those problems that I don't even know about. Uh, yeah, that, that kind of would make sense if you know more ones are coming. Uh, But on the other hand, it doesn't make much sense to think about things that you don't even know about. Uh, the unknown, what is it? The unknown knowns and the known unknowns. Uh, or that was a famous phrase by, what was it? Donald Rumsfeld or something like that? He was talking about the world, about the kind of the dangers in the world. Uh, and a similar kind of thing could maybe apply in this case. Uh, 
So because it is an endless number of problems, one coming after the other, always going to let you down at the end of the day, you just let go of it. You, you realize there is no solution in kind of hanging out there and letting go of these things. Uh, so that is the theory. Uh, for that theory to work, you have to be able to uh, attune your mind to this kind of this way of thinking. Uh, and you have to kind of uh, um, make think in the same way as the Buddha is thinking. And if you do that, then... Uh, uh, Gradually, you will be able to let go of these things. Uh, okay, see what uh, see what we can do. Uh, and uh, let's take the next one. Uh, Dear Ajahn, I hope you're happy to take a question about the sutta we covered at Anglesey. Okay, <laughs> this is the sutta we did at the retreat in Anglesey. Uh, in the uh, sutta, this is the uh, the Sikh sutta. Uh, the uh, Sangyutta Nikai 46.16, it says that the Buddha was sick, suffering, gravely ill. Since this sutta is set after the Buddha became the Buddha, wouldn't he have ceased suffering? Uh, thank you. Um, the word dukkha has many meanings, uh, and in this case maybe it should have been, been, uh, been uh, translated as being in pain. Dukkha can mean just be having painful feelings, uh, yeah? And uh, in that sense, the Buddha uh, doesn't suffer in the sense that people normally suffer, but he still suffers physical pain and the physical discomfort of illness. Uh, he ob obviously wasn't very happy being ill. That's why he asked uh, Mahachunda to chant the seven awakening factors for him, uh, so it could come out of that. Uh, and this is one of those things in the suttas. They talk about the two darts, uh, yeah, the dart of the, uh, the mental dart and the physical dart. Uh, and uh, here comes one of the devas to offer me some uh, a nice drink. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Venerable Deva. <laughs> okay, so that's very nice. So, um, uh, and uh, that physical dart is always going to be there. Even if you become an arahant, you can still feel pain in the body. Uh, it's just that you don't make any problem out of it. Uh, and what you realize is that problem that you make out of the pain, uh, yeah, the... Uh, uh, kind of the obsessing about it, or worrying about it, or the, uh, the making it my prob my pain, or whatever. That is 99% of the problem. Uh, once you take that out of the equation, you can deal with the physical pain um, reasonably well. You still don't like it, obviously, uh, but you can you can deal with it. You don't have any craving to get rid of it uh, because you realize the craving is actually just makes it worse, uh, and the craving itself is a kind of pain. So craving doesn't really arise, uh, but if you can fa find a way out. Uh, like such as chanting the seven bojangas. It's a nice way out of illness, isn't it? Just chant the seven bojangas and bang, you are back in business again. And this is what happened in this case. Now I'm going to have a bit of tea. I apologize. I hope nobody gets jealous. But I <laughs> <laughs> mm, very nice. <laughs> and I apologize for being so naughty. I, I just... Uh, it's nice. I enjoy being a bit naughty sometimes, otherwise life gets so boring. So just uh, <laughs> Okay. <clears throat> Next one. Most venerable sir, in my meditation every morning I do the metta bhavana after the anapana sati bhavana. Recently, as I was meditating, I heard the bird tweeting outside, and the insight came to me that the breath of the bird and mine were one. With that, the understanding all creatures were breathing the same. This helped me develop more compassion to everything. Uh, is this a development progress in my meditation? Your wisdom on this knowledge would be most insightful. Uh. <laughs> May your upwards path be smooth. Um, yes, I, you know, if you feel that sense of connection with other animals, whether they are humans or animals or whatever, it's good because when you feel a connection, you see a commonality. And that commonality is very often the source for compassion and understanding. And breathing the same air, breathing the same breath is like that commonality. And that enables you, as you quite rightly say, to have more compassion. You know, the first, as they say, when we, you know, when we become enemies with other people, we make them different. Uh, we make them somehow, like, you know, when you go to war with a country, the first thing is you demonize the people in that country and say they're really bad people. Or at the very least, the ruler is really evil. So we have a right to invade and we have a right to kill people. Uh, this is what you have to do. If you think of the other ones as people just like you, it's very hard to invade anyone. How can you justify invading people if they are just like you? Uh, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, 
So compassion means having that sense of appreciation that other beings are like you. They feel, they breathe, they suffer, they have everything else. And so compassion makes good sense. So absolutely, and again, what makes something worthwhile and right and appropriate uh, is the result that it gives. And it gives rise to compassion and better qualities of mind, as you say, then it is certainly a right way of perceiving things. So good. So that's, uh, that's nice. It's good that you are heading in that direction. Okay. Dear Ajahn Ramali, thank you for the beautiful Dhamma teachings. Ajahn, could you please advise what type of physical and mental conditions may not be conducive to practice or meditation and why? We must go to do the metta. Um, what type of physical conditions? Well, the physical condition that is not uh, conducive to practice of meditation is a, a, a condition that stops you from being able to focus on your meditation object. Yeah. So what you should do, as always, you should try to find a posture that is suitable for your whatever physical condition someone may have, uh, and that can be used uh, for you. And some people have all kinds of problems, back problems and all kinds of things, uh, and sometimes all they can do is lie down. Sometimes they can't even lie down. That's when you have to kind of. That's when it gets difficult. Uh, maybe you have to go into one of those uh, sensory deprivation chambers or something, or maybe a vacuum. Yeah, sent out with the, some to the kind of to the um, with one of the satellites or something. Uh, uh, but uh, sometimes it is very hard to find a, a, a suitable posture. But sometimes lying down can be the solution. Uh, and there are people who lie down and get very good results in meditation as a. Uh, result of that uh, because when you lie down usually you can relax really well you can be at ease uh, sometimes relax a bit too much and you start snoring but uh, <laughs> uh, but if you have you, if your mindfulness is reasonably well established you can actually lie down and meditate i'm sure many of you here would be able to do that given the right time and place uh, and uh, uh, this monk i mentioned the other day ajahn ganha mentioned before he lies down sometimes when he meditates uh, and he says it's the best posture for meditation because you really relax the body. Uh, yeah, so, uh, and we asked him, well, uh, so what do you do then? I do nothing, he said. Well, if you don't do, don't do anything, well, don't you fall asleep? No, that would be doing something here. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like turning, you have to turn off. Yeah, you have to kind of, otherwise you're just mindful, nothing happens. Uh. <laughs> so that is the physical condition that you have to... Uh, uh, how you overcome the physical conditions, ideally. Uh, yeah, If you still have pains, uh, you, you should ideally try to find a way of getting out of those pains. Uh, mental condition that is unsuitable for meditation, well, if you have some serious psychological condition that uh, can get exacerbated through meditation practice, you have to be careful. Uh, but I know people who, are, who have schizophrenia, for example, uh, and as long as they are properly medicated and they are able to keep that schizophrenia under control, uh, they are perfectly capable of doing meditation practice as well. Uh, um, there may be certain types of mental illnesses which are not suited for meditation. I'm not sure what they might be. It may be some kind of psychotic things or something like that. Uh, but generally speaking, if, you, if your mind is under control uh, and you find that the uh, wholesome qualities inside of you are improving as you meditate, uh, as long as it's heading in the right direction, uh, you are okay. Uh, uh, the way to know it's going in the wrong direction is if you're getting more confused, uh, you're getting more angry, uh, you're getting more deluded as you sit there. Uh, if that is what's happening, that's when you have to be careful. Uh, because that eventually might lead you into a psychotic state. Uh, so be very careful. There are people who sometimes go psychotic on retreats. Uh, yeah, Particularly those retreats that have very strict schedules and very strict sitting periods. Uh, it's quite regularly on those retreats that people actually go psychotic. Uh, it's interesting, isn't it? Uh, I know this one fellow who uh, told me recently he went to one of these retreats and he, he went completely psychotic during this retreat. Uh, and then he, but he kept on practicing afterwards, but in a more gentle way. Uh, and recently he got some very profound samadhi experiences. Uh, so it shows you, if you treat your mind in the right way, yeah, then you get really, really good results. Uh, if you treat your mind in the wrong way, you go psychotic. Uh, it's kind of crazy, isn't it? So you have to be careful with yourself. You have to guard your mind. Uh, and sometimes on those Vipassana retreats, they haven't got a teacher who knows what they're doing. Uh, and all they ever tell you is sit down and watch. Yeah, regardless, even if you know you're going crazy, they say, just watch, yeah, just be mindful. Uh, and then you go crazy. And then, you know, uh, <laughs> 
it's a bit <laughs> so that's how how it goes sometimes so take responsibility for your own practice don't allow other people to overrule what you know is right and uh, if you feel things are getting unbalanced in your mind, uh, that is when you should be careful. Then you don't have the right uh, uh, qualities to kind of move forward. Uh. Okay, dear Ajahn, how does one develop good, well and kind heart knowingly others have done the wrong thing? Um, okay, so how do you develop... Uh, good kind heart and all this kind of stuff when you know others people don't know that you have to learn to forgive yeah so you have to forgive others for what they have done because they don't know what they're doing here they are blind they have no idea what they're doing here and someone who doesn't know what they're doing someone who wants to be happy but does all the things that make them miserable uh, you have to feel sorry for them uh, yeah they are deluded they're walking around in the dark uh, no idea what's going on uh, have compassion for them uh, it's the only rational feeling to have uh, for someone who has no idea what they're up to and doing here. Yeah. It's easy to say, yeah, and I realize that it's easy to say, yeah, but it works. If you do this consistently over a long period of time, that uh, negative feeling you have there will gradually diminish and eventually disappear. Yeah. But if you keep on feeding it by thinking, they did wrong against me, they, they were bad, yeah, then it's never going to die down. Yeah. We were just reading that beautiful verse from the Dhammapada this morning. I'm not sure if you were here. And the Dhammapada says that if you keep on thinking like that, they beat me, they cheated me, they ruined me, whatever. But for someone who thinks like that, hatred never dies down. But for someone who does not think like that, hatred dies down. So don't think like that. Think instead forgiveness, kindness, compassion. Yeah, because this is the, in the end, this is the only rational way of thinking. It's the best way for you and also the best way for the other person. Huh? Well, Bajan, is there a difference between transferring and sharing merits? Uh, if one merits is little, how can one share with so many beings in space, including departed past relatives, living ones and devas, etc.? Would one's departed ones receive little or all if one only transfer to one particular relative? Uh, one uh, uh, is that one is born in the ghost realm. Thank you. Uh, yours in the Dhamma. Uh, uh, don't worry about how much merit you have. Maybe you have much more merit than you think. Yeah, it's hard to really gauge these things. So what you do is you share whatever you have. And the point, one of the points of sharing is that uh, it is good for you as well. Yeah, because it's like being generous in a sense. I share this with someone else uh, and actually you get even more merit by sharing your merits. Uh, it's an easy way of getting more merit, yeah? But you have to, it has to come from the heart. You can't just be superficial. <laughs> so what's the difference between transferring and sharing? The difference is that uh, it is really about sharing. Uh, you cannot really transfer. Uh, it's just a kind of expression that we use. Uh, because transfer means that you have less and the other person gets more. But that's not what's happening. What's happening is that you are telling the other person, I share this with you. In other words, you are saying, I love you. I'm your friend. I have compassion for you. That's what you're saying. Yeah. So I give you this. I want you to share in this. I do this on your behalf. Yeah. I want to be kind to you. That's what you're doing. It's an act of kindness. So you do an act of merit in their name and then they feel happy as a consequence. And if they, as you say, have been reborn in the right place, like the ghost realm or whatever, then they may be able to feel that because there's still some connection to the human realm. They can hear, they can experience what is going on. And then you feel happy because you have given something to others. Don't worry how much merit you have. Just do it because it's good to do regardless. And if that particular person is not there, somebody else will receive it. Isn't that nice? The Buddha said so. It's not me making this up. I, I, try, I always try to base myself on the suttas. Yeah? The Buddha said so. There was a famous, there was a Brahmin called Janusoni. He went to the Buddha and he said, well, you know, if I, if I give you know, to someone who has passed away and they're not there, have I wasted my, kind of my, my gift? I can't remember exactly how the sutta goes, but I haven't read it for years. But, and then they were, no, if it, if it doesn't go to them, then it will go to another relative of yours in that realm. And then Yanusona said, but what if I don't have any relatives in that realm? And the Buddha says, it is impossible. It cannot be that through all this long time, you should have no relatives in that realm. Guaranteed, you will have relatives in the ghost realm. 
Yeah, so you share regardless, and someone will benefit from that. Uh, it's quite nice, isn't it? Uh, so you just have that beautiful intention, and then people can share. Okay, Ajahn Ramali, it's nice to see you again. Okay, which one? Is <laughs> Good. Uh, what's your advice for someone who is on the way to gain financial independence from a bad relationship uh, while practicing metta meditation kindness in daily life? Uh, okay, so you are moving to, to gain financial independence from a bad relationship while practicing metta meditation. Okay. Especially when the mind tends to identify the things uh, okay, things as self, yeah, so various things as self. Uh, therefore, the doer keeps the mind busy uh, during meditation. Uh, um, Yes, um, it takes a long time to kind of de-identify with things. Yeah, things are. This is the the problem: is that you have all these things that we identify with, and those things are the things that, as you say, they keep you busy in meditation practice because you think about them and you need to keep up all of these things so that your identity doesn't feel like it is fading away. We are by definition very tied to our identity. So uh, you just have to, I guess, you know, slowly kind of let go of these things uh, to see how silly it is uh, to remember that when you die, you have to let go of all of those things. The only thing that you keep when you die is your kamma. You are the owner of your kamma, said the Buddha. And that kamma is basically the mind that you have developed in this life. So if you have built up a happy mind and a kind mind, a mind with beautiful qualities, that is what goes with you to the future. And you know that's true, yeah? Because as you develop these qualities, they tend to lodge inside of you and you carry them with you. They don't disappear. So when you die, it's exactly the same thing. You carry them with you. So when you die, all, that, all of those other things, belongings, when I do death contemplation, I always start out by saying, well, you have to let go of your friends and family, yeah? Because obviously they can't go with you when you die. Uh, actually, first of all, your belongings, uh, yeah, all your physical belongings, uh, then your friends and family, all the people in your life, uh, that's even harder to let go of. Uh, then you have to let go of all your mental possessions, uh, all the identity in this life, your social identity, your gender identity, your religious identity perhaps even, your national identity, your identity with whatever it is, your wealth, your income, your social status, all of that has to go as well. Uh. Yeah, when you die, it's going to happen. So why wait till you die? Let go of it now. Now is the opportunity. If you don't let go of that now, chances are you will not be able to let go when you die. Why? Because that procrastination that you have now, you will take that with you into the future and you will still not be able to do it when you actually pass away. So you will die. You're going to have to let go of it. So do it now. Same thing with the body. The physical body is the last thing I usually talk about during the death contemplation. That also has to go when you die. Yeah? So let go of it now. And what happens when you let go of the body now? You go into samadhi because the body is the main hindrance for taking you into samadhi practice. So train on dying. And when you train on dying, actually it has a very, very beneficial effect for your samadhi practice. There was a famous ancient Indian uh, uh, sadhu uh, uh, Ramana Maharshi, who, who, who uh, was well known uh, uh, around the world, and uh, he lived back in the 1950s, I think. Uh, and he, uh, one of those people, he got into a very powerful state of samadhi when he was young, uh, uh, and he did that from death contemplation. Yeah, he really did a death contemplation all the way, and bang, he went to a step of samadhi as a consequence. Uh, so death contemplation is enough to enter deep samadhi. Uh, be why? Because you have to let go of so much. Uh, Okay, so I hope that helps. Dear Ajahn, can you please explain what it means by watching the whole body of breath in Anapanasati meditation? Thank you. What it means by watching the whole body of breath means that you watch the full breath from beginning to end. Yeah, You see the whole uh, physical event rather than just seeing parts of it. That's what it means. So initially you see the breath as short or long. You have, you have a kind of fairly... A fairly superficial 
understanding of the breath you only know like a little bit of it you know one thing whether it's short or long but later on you expand your awareness your mindfulness expands and you see everything that is to see there maybe not everything you see more yeah you see it from beginning to end and that's kind of the point here so it really is just a measure for how sharp your mindfulness is and your mindfulness should be sharpening as you do this but remember the sharpening happens automatically you don't do it it just happens as a consequence of being present being passive being aware having the right attitude Uh, it's already 4.30. I will just continue uh, finishing off. There's a few questions left. Uh, so if you have to go or anything, please feel free to leave at any time. Uh, but uh, for those who wish, wish to hear, I will just continue uh, till we're finished. Uh, in the Anapanasati Sutta, there are 16 exercises for practicing the full awareness of breathing. Uh, can you advise how we should actually make use of these in a typical meditation session every day? Uh, um in an everyday session, you don't normally, you wouldn't normally practice all the 16 steps. These 16 steps, they build on each other. I taught the whole Anapanasati Sutta during the retreat. I spent two full sessions on it, two hours. So if you want to hear all the details, maybe you can get hold of the recordings. I think it was, it was recorded. Yeah, it was recorded, uh, audio recordings. Uh, so normally what you do during daily life is that you try to do just the very initial stages of the Anapanasati Sutta. Yeah? And if you can do that much already, it is actually great benefit in daily life. So remember that the first thing to do is to establish mindfulness. And in daily life, sometimes you may not even be able to establish mindfulness properly because life is so busy, there's so many things happening. And sometimes all you have to do is just to relax and chill and do nothing at all. Sit back, yeah, enjoy some music and just feel exhausted. And that's okay. Sometimes that happens. At other times, you may have a bit of spare energy, perhaps especially on the weekend or maybe early in the morning after you get up. And that is the time when mindfulness can get established. And when, once mindfulness is established, you just bring the breath into your awareness and you stay with the breath. Yeah, that's all you have to do. And then uh, you try to be the uh, passive observer, the passenger on the train, not the one who does the meditation, but the one who experiences the meditation, uh, and then you allow the meditation to develop itself. Uh, that's, that's what you do. And then you see how far the meditation goes. Uh, these steps are not steps that you do. These are steps that happen when you experience the breath. Uh, and how far you go in these steps will depend on uh, the qualities that you go into the meditation with. Uh, yeah, that is actually what will depend, will, will, will decide how far you go in these things. So you don't do anything, you just establish the cause at the beginning and you allow the process to happen. That is the right way of doing this. I hope that makes sense. And uh, otherwise, please listen to the recordings and maybe that will be helpful for you. Uh, uh, and I'm, there are other people as well, obviously, who uh, teach the Anapanasati Sutta. So uh, you can, if not satisfied with my explanation, you can also look at other people's explanations. So. It was reported that a country introduced the law that allows stoning to death for adultery, chopping off hand for stealing. Uh, what's the Buddhist view uh, comment? Uh, Okay, um, I, I can give you my comment. I'm not sure if I can give you the exact Buddhist view, but I can give you my view on this and from a Buddhist perspective. What to do if one were to live in this kind of country? Where is kindness? Um, yes, this, this is uh, the kind of, you know, this, this sounds like, uh, if I may be allowed to say so, it sounds like the charia law, the law that you have in, in Muslim countries when they follow religious law instead of secular law. And uh, when this happens, this is kind of the kind of rulings you have. I know it's quite common in places like the Middle East. If you steal, they chop off your hand, for example. It's a typical Islamic law kind of thing. Yeah. So, um, um, so I would say that in Buddhism, we don't really 
agree with that. We wouldn't do that. I would say if I was a, a ruler and I was trying to follow Buddhist values, it was, I would never suggest that anyone should be physically punished at all. Physical punishment doesn't make sense. Maybe you put people in jail just to save other people from you know, being kind of abused by people, but I don't think it's necessary to do anything more than that. And once they are in jail, in my opinion, we should have a system that tries to rehabilitate people, get them back on their feet so they can become upright citizens of the, of the country again. Uh, there are some very interesting statistics about criminals. Uh, uh, it is only a very tiny number of criminals that are hardened criminals that actually have this as a way of life. Uh, the vast majority of people who go to jail are ordinary people who end up doing a mistake or two who actually want to go back to society again. Uh, but unfortunately, our penal system is such that very often you go to jail and you come out a worse person than when you went in. You're even more criminal when you come out again. So the first thing you do when you come out is start back, back to square one. Isn't that kind of terrible? Instead, we should have a system whereby the prisons are such they should be humane, they should be based on kindness, on forgiveness, because we know people do things for all kinds of stupid reasons, such as being conditioned into it by who knows what. And then we can actually rehabilitate them, bring them back into society as upright citizens, and they can then contribute to society again. Uh, but, of course, the idea of revenge gets in the way for that. So we have to get out of this idea of revenge. Revenge is useless. It's pointless. Uh, if there is revenge to be had, Kama will look after that, as they say. Uh, so we don't no need for us to kind of uh, do any revenge. Uh, that is how I kind of see the penal system as working according to Buddhist values. Uh, that's what I would like to see. Not only Buddhist, but sensible values, yeah? kind of rational values. That makes sense. Uh, um, if you live in this kind of kingdom, uh, what what you should do, you should not steal, yeah, because then you are you get you into serious trouble. Huh? So avoid stealing when you go to that kingdom. Huh? <laughs> so uh, uh, where is kindness? Um, remember that the problem with religion is that religion often gets people very, sometimes very excited and very indoctrinated, and gets very you have very strong views about things. Huh? So sometimes, you know, you uh, uh, I, sometimes there may be even in countries like that, you will find a lot of people who are kind, even though the penal system is made up according to some kind of doctrine or theory or or whatever it is. People are still people. Huh? You will find kind people there. You will find unkind people there. Yeah, just like everywhere else. So don't don't judge the ordinary people uh, because of the penal system of the country. Huh? Judge ordinary people when you know them, huh? and even then, be careful with your judgment. Huh? Uh, there's good people everywhere. That's one of the things I have found anyway in my life. Wherever I travel, you always find the same mix of people. Good, bad, in between, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, okay. Most Venerable Bhante, what would be the best thing to do when one feels about the hopelessness of samsaric journey? Yeah, that's a good start. Yeah, when you feel that, you are in the right, heading in the right direction. <laughs> <laughs> One, one feels it is very difficult to see an end. Much married to you. Huh? Yeah, so that's, that's already it's a good starting point. Yeah? If you see that samsaric journey is kind of hopeless, then there is only one answer. Get off the samsaric journey. Huh? And uh, the way to do that, this is the sort of things that we have been exploring over the past few days. Uh, get uh, committed to practice the Buddhist values. Uh, be kind, be generous, do the right thing, do a bit of meditation practice, read some suttas, listen to the discourses. Uh, and as you do that, gradually you will emerge from samsara, and one day you will be completely free of it. Uh, but yes, the, I, I fully, absolutely agree with you. You look at the world, you look at the politics, you look at, uh, and uh, it has always been a bit like that. Yeah, you look at the history of the world, it's exactly the same thing. Things go up and down, you have wars, you have bad wars, people getting killed. And uh, it's always been like that, and it probably always will be like that. And it will be like that because the root conditions are exactly the same. The root conditions are delusion. The root conditions are selfishness. The root conditions are hatred. The root conditions are the same. Uh, so now, right now, in places like, uh, in many places like Australia, you have a fairly stable and nice society, not too many problems. Uh, but how long will it last? Uh, yeah, it just happens to be like that now. It may not last. Uh, don't be surprised if it comes crashing down and then suddenly we are living in kind of uh, European middle age times, yeah, when things were very dark, yeah, something like that may come back again. Huh? You just don't know. Huh? So don't take anything for granted. Huh? And when you take nothing for granted, huh, you feel the sense of urgency to do the practice now. 
So well done. That sounds to me like you're on the right track. Yeah? So keep up the good work. Yeah. <laughs> okay. I hope that was what you meant. I, I, I'm just kind of uh, interpreting a little bit, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Hi, Ajahn. Your Dhamma talks have inspired me to read more of the suttas. Thank you very much. Uh, in your opinion, what is a good starting point? Is there a recommended sequence of reading to complement my practice? Uh, thank you kindly. Uh, um, there is n no real sequence. The, uh, uh, the right sequence is read those suttas that inspire you. Uh, and uh, if you find it hard to understand certain suttas, you can skip them. But you can also listen to talks online yeah, of people who do sutta readings. Uh, and there are many people who do that and many people who are very well qualified in doing that. So find someone you feel you can trust and you feel speaks to you in the right way. Uh, and then listen to that as a guide, especially in the beginning. After a while, you start to become more independent. Uh, you can read the suttas uh, on your own. And then you can start arguing with me uh, about my about my interpretation. It's always good fun. That's the, what I did with Ajahn Brahma. Initially, I just listened to him, and after a while, I started arguing. Uh, and then, uh, and then it was, uh, he, he was, yeah. Anyway, so, <laughs> it's good, yeah, that's, it's good. It's important to become independent in, in these things. Uh, a good place to start reading is a book called In the Buddha's Words, uh, which I believe you have, probably have in the library here. Is that right, uh, Yasmin? Yeah, okay. You have that. And that is by translation by Bhikkhu Bodhi. It's an uh, anthology, so he has taken out the suttas from very, various parts of the canon, compiled them, put them together into sections under certain themes. Then he has long introductions to explain and also footnotes at the back to explain. So it's a very nice way of getting started with the suttas. And once you have that, you can start reading the suttas. Now there, you can either you can read them in physical books, such as I took it away, such as the Majjhima Nikaya is a really nice collection to start with because they are fairly substantial suttas, and many of them have to do with the life of the Buddha and many other interesting topics. So the middle length sayings is a good place to start. These days, you can read the suttas online. If you go to suttacentral.net, yeah, this is uh, the website by the redoubtable Ajahn Sujato, if you have heard about him. He is one of these people who has, he has translated all the four Nikayas on his own. So, um, and uh, the suttas are there, and they are translated in a very modern language, uh, much more modern than Bhikkhu Bodhi. Uh, like, uh, what was one of the, yeah, well, like one place he says, what does he say? No worries or something like that. Is that, is that what he translates? <laughs> What was it again? Relax. Relax was a, relax is one of them. I wonder if it says no worries somewhere as well. But relax is definitely one of them. That's exactly right. Uh, yeah. Relax, Mara. <laughs> that was the one. And uh, so it is very accessible. And when it is accessible like that, you feel almost as if you could be in the presence of the Buddha. If the language is too stilted, too technical, too elevated, too philosophical, it creates a natural barrier between you and the Buddha. But when you read in a natural language, you actually feels almost like you're there. It makes it come alive much better. So check out those translations. And uh, uh, maybe if you are a very conservative Buddhist, you may not be to your liking. Uh, but uh, uh, I think many of you might appreciate those translations. Uh, so uh, try that and see what happens. Last question for today. Dear Ajahn, at times people, mostly colleagues, are very unaccepting about some of my lifestyle decisions, particularly not using alcohol or pursuing romantic and sexual relationships. Do you have any su suggestions for how I could foster acceptance in them, or at least get them to stop hassling me? <laughs> Many thanks. Uh, okay. Uh, one of the things is to, one of the important things is to be very low key about these things uh, and not sort of put it into people's other people's face that I'm living like this. But don't don't make a fuss and bother about it. Uh, and uh, if uh, people. Uh, ask you out and you have to go out and you are the only one who doesn't drink well just say something like doctor's orders can't drink yeah yeah who's a doctor the buddha is the doctor huh? yeah <laughs> so not really not really lying it's a little bit on the edge but not really lying yeah so find some kind of clever excuse like that or make sure that you're already drinking something else or whatever it is so that you kind of don't get trapped but be very low key about your decisions to live in this uh, uh, in a different way because people do actually quite rightly find fault with you if you do that um, and uh, so that is i think the most important thing here 
And uh, apart from that, uh, once they kind of know and if they are hassling you about it, uh, um, I don't know. It's <laughs> know what you can do. You just have to, I guess, just uh, sometimes you just have to shrug your shoulders and say, okay, it's their problem, yeah, and not, not worry too much about it, too much about it, uh, and kind of carry on. Uh, and uh, people are just, people often feel threatened uh, when people do things that are very different, like not drinking. Uh, it reminds them maybe they too should not be drinking, yeah. But because it is such a part of the Australian culture, actually not just Australia, everywhere in the world you, you go, drinking is a very important part of the culture. Because of that, it is very difficult for them to accept. But deep down, they may realize that you have a point. And that's why they get defensive and then they hassle you. Yeah. So maybe the best thing is to understand that they are just feeling insecure probably. They may not look insecure, but deep down they may actually be insecure. Huh? And once you do that, you can shrug your shoulders more easily and not worry too much about it. Okay, whatever, it's fine. If you, if you need to say those things, then uh, uh, please, please do so. It's just your need. Got nothing to do with uh, the problems. Uh, and as far as um, not pursuing romantic relationships, uh, I mean th th that is kind of silly. Yeah, that we kind of us we have to pursue romantic relationships. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, just you know, again, you just have to. If that's if they want to hassle you, hassle you for it, don't react to it. If you react to it, sometimes people like to hassle you even more. Yeah, so don't kind of react too much, and just kind of shrug your shoulders, and again, feel that they don't really understand because they don't understand. They probably deserve a bit of compassion. So once you can have compassion for them, and understanding you, it won't bother you anymore, and then it's not a problem. And probably it will just fade away by itself as a consequence of that. Gradually, 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 and one day you wonder why it ever was a problem in the first place. Maybe that will work, maybe it won't. Yeah, who knows? But see, and then uh, uh, see how it goes, and then uh, uh, see what happens. So, either that, or you can be start wearing these robes, yeah? <laughs> Come to the come to the monastery, and then uh, it won't be a problem for you anymore. Nobody in the monastery hassles you for not drinking. Everyone says sadhu sadhu. <laughs> okay, that is all for today. So uh, nice to have you all here. And uh, then uh, uh, tomorrow morning there will be another dhamma talk. Jeep, so many dhamma talks. <laughs> and uh, so if you wish to come for that, you're of course most welcome. Otherwise, look after yourself, take care, keep on practicing, read the suttas, and then every one of you will grow in the dhamma as a consequence.